Just to kind of give you an idea of how the evening is going to go, um, we have a, uh, a film that one of our mothers out front has put together for us. And then I will uh, speak a little bit about what Mothers Out Front is about, and also about climate change and global warming and whatever. And then after that, Jean, your uh, crew is going to speak about their presentation and who and what they're about. And um, they're new people for us on the block, but they're um, been wonderful. And of course, Jean has been here for many moves. So. Oh. So, yes, yes. Yes, many, many moves. Many, many moves. Um, Mary, there's plenty of seats up here. There, there's plenty of seats up here and, and whatever. All right, Laura, are you set? Yeah. We're directing the people to not listen. Hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, we're going to start. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone who came tonight. Um, of course, we had concerns. Uh, would we get enough people that um, we would be able to communicate where we're coming from when it deals with climate change, global warming, resiliency, meaning the things that we need to do to protect our communities and where those resources will be and what we can do for our communities and what we can also do for ourselves. So I really thank all of you for being here with us today. Before we move on, I want to thank Jean Maggio. Um, for helping us get this together today. For those who may not know, Jean was presented with an award at our dinner, the chamber dinner, for her service to our community. And it's a well-deserved um, award that she has. All right, we also want, as I said, want to thank her. And um, I even said to them, sometimes I have to remember what crew really actually the acronym is. And it's Communities Responding to Extreme Weather. That's what crew stands for. And as I said, um, they are relatively a new group. Uh, they have been a part of other environmental groups. Tonight we're also going to have um, Fire Chief Paul Flanagan with us who will be here with at least to answer some of your questions. Um, with Paul there at some of our meetings, um, I learned so much from him that I didn't know before. And I thought, hey, I know everything. You know? <laughs> but of course I don't. And I have to say, I've been doing with working with our mothers out front for a little bit over two years. And I have to say that I have learned such a wealth of information that um, I can't tell you how important it has been for me and the wonderful people that we have worked with. So I'm going to give it to Aaron. Aaron is going to be our video person. And we also have Barbara Bishop in the back who is going to be filming the night. And you'll be able to see it on WCAT. Thank you, Barbara. Huh? Oh, yes, I want to say that we have Ron Vecchia with us tonight. And Ron is president of the council. And it's very important to have Ron here so he can see it. And his lovely wife, Linda. So thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you. Right. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Suzanne uh, Hitchcock, Brian or Brian Hitchcock, is um, going to do the presentation to begin today's um, event. Good evening and welcome. I'm Suzanne Hitchcock Bryan, and I'm a proud member of Winthrop Mothers Out Front, and a proud member of Winthrop Medical Reserve Corps. I'm here tonight via video because I'm caring for my two grandchildren, Eli almost four and Nora almost two. It is for them that I do this work. I will tell you a little bit about Mothers Out Front and why we are working to address climate change 
and Jean Maggio and Chief Flanagan will talk about the Medical Reserve Corps and ways to prepare for extreme weather. And in between, Craig Altimos and Aaron Troncoso from CRU, and that stands for Cu Communities Responding to Extreme Weather, will connect the dots from climate change to impacts to preparation. So mothers out front. We are mothers and others who are working for a livable planet for all children and future generations. We are out front protecting, educating, and calling for climate action so we can have health benefits for us now and for our children and grandchildren. So we can have a robust economy with the creation of renewable energy jobs. So we can have a habitable planet for all living creatures. Quite simply, climate change is not a future problem, it's a current problem. And we have all experienced impacts in Winthrop, and we do want to hear your stories. For me, I have experienced many flooded roads, some wind and ice damage to my house and car. My house insurance has gone up $350 in one year, and that's without making any claims. And I was very disappointed when a Belle Isle festival was canceled because of mosquitoes. You may have experienced flooding and higher flood insurance rates, more mosquitoes, ticks, they love the heat, and increased rain. I, quite frankly, don't love the extreme heat. It can be a silent killer, and it can affect our breathing, our heart, our thinking, our energy and it can exacerbate diabetes. How about the cold? Remember, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. Arctic sea ice is melting. The Arctic is warming, and the polar jet stream is getting wobbly. And instead of moving west to east, it's moving north to south. And when it moves south, it brings the frigid air, that polar vortex with it. Did you know that when it was 4 degrees here, it was 39 degrees in Juneau, Alaska, and 114 in Australia? Your environmental allergies may be worse. Pollen loves carbon dioxide. Growing season starts earlier and ends later. Have you had to take your allergy medicine earlier and stay on it later? How about winter sports? Skiing, ice skating, snowmobiling, are they affected? We are having more winter rain, aren't we? So why is this happening here in Winthrop? And you know, as you know, some parts of the country and the world have it much worse. Okay, so here's the quick answer. When we drill, distribute, burn fossil fuels, and that's oil, gas, coal, we produce greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane. And these gases trap the heat all around the Earth. Think of it like a blanket. Think of the Earth being inside a greenhouse. So our atmosphere warms, and then it has more energy. We have wilder storms. And it holds more water we get more precipitation, and our oceans warm, and they expand, and they evaporate more water into the atmosphere. Basically, with global warming, we have an intensification of the water cycle. Where it's wet, it's wetter. Where it's dry, it's drier. Where it's hot, it's hotter. And the storms are more energetic, etc. So, let's act on climate and do all we can to move away justly from fossil fuels and renewable and to renewable forms of energy, wind, solar, geothermal. Now there's much we can do individually, and we can have a separate com conversation uh, on this. Energy efficiency, decrease waste, decrease plastic, and Mary Alice Sharkey will speak to uh, this. 
solar roof panels, electric vehicles, switching to green energy for all our electricity. And by the way, National Grid can provide all green electricity to your home today. It's easy to make the switch. But as Michael Mann says, the single biggest way to have an impact on climate change is through collective pressure on policymakers to act in our interests rather than special interests. So we can contact our legislators and hold them accountable. We can do this, but we do need to act now. And even with action, we can expect to see more impacts from climate change. So we will hear from Mary Alice, and then Craig, Aaron, Jean, and Chief Flanagan will further discuss impacts and preparedness in the event of extreme weather. Thanks so much for coming. I just want to introduce Craig and Aaron. They are both our representatives and leaders for the crew. So I just wanted, I missed them, so I wanted to make sure that we spoke about them. All right, so my presentation tonight will be to give a little background on what Mothers Out Front is about, who we are, and how we work with climate change, global warming, and especially when it comes to children. And when we put down mothers and, it's, and others out front, it's about grandpops and uncles and nurturers that are male and female. It's not, you don't have to be a mother to be part of our group. But our main men uh, mission is to ensure a livable climate for all, including our children. Um, we're also part of a strong community within our group and within, thank God, all of you that are here in attendance today. And we're built on relationships, kindness, mutual respect, and collaboration. We also need to lift our voices, and that's what we're doing tonight. We're lifting our voices to those who care and nurture children, because if we do, those who are the leaders in our town, in our state, and in our country will hear and heed us because we are giving out the message about care for children in our environment. Uh, part of us is that we want all children to feel safe. We need to be honest, though, with our children about climate change. And our information has to be diversified according to the age of our children. We don't want them to become anxious so they get scared. Instead, we want to help children connect with their environment and learn to care for their world. Introduce them to the outside world. Introduce them to fishing, to do anything, skiing, whatever they are interested in, to get them to appreciate how important our world is, especially our environment. It's also good to emphasize hope for all of us. I think we all need to know that we're not going to just always be in a hole, that we will raise, our, or raise ourselves up, and that knowledge and action is power. We can all help each other. We can all care about our world. <clears throat> I heard um, Suzanne talk about um, global warming and climate change and how it affects us, our health, and the diseases that are now uh, very prevalent. Um, increased temps expand the growing season, and it also expands the zones for mosquitoes and ticks. And the tick-borne illnesses, which is the Asian tiger mosquitoes, I'm sorry, the ticks are, carry our Lyme disease, and the Asian tiger mosquito carries the Zika. Now, I think we all think of Zika more so in Africa and our southern climates. Well, Zika is also now rising into our areas because we are warmer and the climate is good for them. 
Also, asthma and allergies, because as you heard Suzanne say, our growing season has expanded. <coughs> and more of our carbon dioxide plants are spreading more pollen. So children are having a harder time to breathe, including ourselves. Um, and children <coughs> breathe faster than us. They also spend more time outside and also um, have lungs that are still developing. So children five and under are very strong that they could get any one of these illnesses. So where does this all come from? <laughs> and what we know is that the number one cause of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere are power plants and factories. One third of the amount of carbon dioxide that goes into our atmosphere comes from those sources. Also, what we don't always realize is that right up on the tail of power plants is transportation. Cars and trucks, the exhaust from our cars and trucks trucks also are a proponent for carbon uh, dioxide. And also one thing that a lot of people aren't familiar with is fracking. And fracking is a way of us being able to obtain gas and oil by putting a long well in, going over, going down about a mile to a mile and a half, going over, forcing water and chemicals and sand down through that well who breaks up the shale, and that shale releases the methane gas and then goes up. The reason for sand is they need something to keep those cracks open. So the sand keeps the cracks open until all the shale is used up. And what happens with that, many times, the methane gas releases where it should not and goes into our atmosphere. Now, carbon uh, dioxide can actually stay in our atmosphere for a good hundred years or up to a hundred years. Methane usually is only 25 years but is a stronger gas that hurts us more, hurts our town more, our community more. So as I said, our atmosphere is, contam is contaminated by the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, which is the burning of coal, gas, and oil, which are all fossil fuels. The effects of global warming is, of course, the increase in climate. I think all of us can relate for the poor people up in Northern California who lost their homes this summer and this fall. And all of that, or the majority of it, was because of the high heat, the dry ground, and once it burnt, it was hard to stop it. We also know of the drought. Now, we in this area don't really get affected by drought. But people in the, our Midwest are really starting to feel the drought effects, which of course is eventually going to hit us because we're going to lose the food sources that the middle of our country produces. And we also have, which I think we all know, in Asia and Africa are extreme drought areas, and the people there and the babies there are all dying from the lack of food and also because of the extreme heat. This is the area where we all have been exposed to, and that's with the rising sea levels, the hurricanes, and the floods. What we sometimes forget is our planet is mostly water, 70%. And what has happened is that water has started to start churning, and it's churning and churning, and it's causing more and more heat to come about. And it's affecting, so it's increasing our, um, the, our heat, and that is what's causing more hurricanes and stronger hurricanes, more flooding. So all of that is part of what's going on with the global warming. Recently, in the Globe last week, was a, a doctor, Dr. Bodak, who just recently died. And he was the first person who brought up global warming and climate change. And he woke up people in the 70s to say, hey, listen, this is 
isn't just something that's happening every once in a while. Unless we start doing something about it, it's going to continue and get worse and worse. So, <clears throat> moving on. <laughs> what we need to do is to start using more renewable energy. Solar, wind, hydro. All right? And I know that I'm going to pick on Karina in the back there. Karina and part of her energy committee had started last year about bringing in solar panels for all of Winthrop at a very, very reasonable <coughs> price. And what had happened is she did not get a lot of people who um, wanted to take her up on it. And I have to say, including my family, because I live in a condo and you have to have everybody in the condo to agree to it. And until you do that, you're kind of at a loss. But um, please, if anyone is interested, I know, don't think we have the program right now, but I know Karina knows the gentleman that she worked with to try to see if anybody, and this is Karina right here, I know I'm, I'm pointing and not, uh, all right? Okay, so anyway, what we're, one of the things that's going on right now is the Global Warming Solutions Act. And what that is, it's mandating by the year 2020, which is a year from now, that we would have 25% less carbon in our atmosphere. That's not going to happen, but it's close. We're kind of like 18, 19%. But what I don't think we're going to do it unless we get ourselves going and beat our guns and stuff is by the year 2050, that we are going to have to supposedly be at 80%. That's kind of going to be a toughie. What's happened when I think about um, the flooding and um, all of the hurricanes is that one thing which is important for Winthrop is that in the next five years, it has been said that our sea level rise will be six inches. Now you might say, eh, six inches, not too bad. Six inches is a lot, there's a lot. And by the year 2050, it's going to be three feet high. And if you read um, today's or yesterday, oh yes, with today's globe, Governor Baker is talking about the, at the turn of the, our century, that it could be six to eight feet high. <coughs> So we have already lost 650 acres in Winthrop from the flooding and all of the water impact. So it's important for us to really get strong and as we're saying, contact um, <coughs> Senator Bob, I'm sorry, uh, Speaker Bob DeLeo. And Joe Boncori, who <coughs> Joe Boncori has been extremely important, he has, um, brought us as mothers out front to all of you. Speaker DeLeo has started to do a great job. He's starting to do a proposal that he's going to spend $1 billion over the next year for climate control, global warming control, and also resiliency, and, the, and to reduce carbon dioxide. So that's a very positive thing. And also Governor Baker has also put it into his budget also about doing that. So we have to thank them um, and to write them and let them know. Sometimes we bang on their door when we don't think they're doing enough. But now it's time to bang on their door and say, thank you for what you have done for us. So I think that you'll see that a bill that has, is going on is a bill by Jennifer Benson, who... Um, but Mary Alice, but then we say thank you, but we need the policies. Right, mm -hmm. what, honey? We say thank you, but we need the policies. Right, we need yeah. for them to be passed in the House, in the Senate, and for we the need bills. those to be passed. <laughs> and he will, and all mm -hmm. of them have said that they would <coughs> move forward with the strength. And finally, um, we're just talking about uh, Jennifer Benson, who's a representative, and she wants to charge people, these power plants and these factories, for how much uh, carbon dioxide they're using within their plants and their factories, and it will be charged according to tonnage. 
And those fees will come back to us in our communities to work with us on the resiliency and whatever. And I'm running too many, yes, yes. Could you repeat those statistics again on how far the sea will rise and when? Yes, in, um, in five years, we're talking about six inches. By 2050, we're talking three feet. In, from what I was reading in the Globe today, uh, Governor Baker had sources that said by the end of the century, it could be six, seven, eight feet high by that time. And those, as obviously, are not, is not a positive thing for Winthrop. Um, and um, there, are, there is a website on the town of Winthrop that will talk about resiliency, and it gives you a lot of facts and figures um, that are, it's very important and helpful. Maureen? Yes, you, you um, <coughs> excuse me, cited some figures on acreage that we lost. <coughs> Where have we lost that? Over, um, it could be, um, I, I'm going Vermont. to tell you, Maureen, I've, in my reading, it just said that we have already lost 650 acres over X amount of years. I, I think that that's not just like all things by its distributor, so it's all the whole coastline, basically, yeah. it's a little bit here, a little bit here. Beach erosion, yes. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. For Yes. <coughs> no, no. Just for winter? I live at 76 Yes. I moved in there in 78, and then the existing problem that was brought on the My house was the floor, but I had to carry my wife across the street, and they had money. I couldn't get my driver. Yeah. The wheel, who was, I'm not the one, I'm sorry, Bobby the first one. Uh, back then, Mr. Demento was one of the selectmen. Mm -hmm. I brought him down on a Sunday morning. I was going, we were going up after the weekend, for the week, sitting down on vacation on Sunday, and I had three feet of water in the weekend. So now, as we went forward, they did a big project down there, their own there. Yes. In the 80s, and they resurrected some of the years. Well, I had a, I had a, I had a, a suit. Speak up, Steve. I had a sewage break in my line. My you want son, to speak up? Yeah, Stand up. My son was the uh, operations manager of the town. He worked with a lot of the gentlemen, probably almost Steve Cowell and them. Yes. So my son says, I'll, I'll do the break myself. I'll do it. I'll get some records. Mm -hmm. We'll try to do it. Upon getting a camera down there, we found out that my central line for my, you know, my excess waste coming mm -hmm. out of the house was never connected. Okay. So that ended up being a project the town had to incur the money. Now, going forward from there, that's, that was a few years ago. In the 80s, 1981, we had a, mm -hmm. a, a sun, or the moon line got together. Mm -hmm. We had a big storm yes. at first. Yep. I had four feet of water that day. Mm -hmm. Now, 30 years after that, I didn't have, a, I didn't have any, any, any floods, maybe a few inches here and there. In October of last year, <coughs> yeah. we had that rain. Yep. I had three, three and a half, four feet. I lost the car. Wow. Okay. Going forward, January 4th. We had another storm. I was displaced for five months. I lived at yep. my daughter's house, lost two cars, everything in my cellar, six feet of water in my cellar, and <coughs> my circuit board 30 seconds before I got out of the cellar. Now, I understand all this. Believe me, I really do. And I, like I said, I want to put a damper on this. But this is fine going forward, 2050 and all that. But we need to have something, something done now. now. And I the know. thing I think is going to help, and everybody can disagree or agree if they want to, when they put the walkway in, down Bell Isle. They pulled out a natural buffer, a natural, a natural buffer that was behind it because it was about four feet high and it was all branches, mm -hmm. just naturally growing. <coughs> they just did a big project down on the beach yes. you know, and they put a new buffer in. What is to stop them from putting anything? A buffer, if that buffer was there, they never replaced it after they finished that walkway. Mm -hmm. I don't think me and the residents in my area would have got six feet of water. I know. I've got pictures to show you in my phone of what I went through. I was on TV, Channel 4 on TV, yep. Channel 7. And I understand, again, I don't want to put a damper on this. Yep. And I understand going forward with, with the fossil fuels and everything. It's, it's, but we need something now. I mean, I'm, I'm on the cusp of selling my house in a town that I want to be in. Yeah. Because I can't do it. I'm 66 years old. Yep. I can't go through it much for the last year. I put a burden on my family. I had to live in my daughter's house for five and a half months. It was awful. And, I, and then, I'm a vet. Thank God I'm a vet because my uh, veterans insurance kicked in and helped me out. The national flood, I didn't get my last check until December. And I was eight, I eight out, out of eight thousand dollar damage, I only recouped forty thousand. Mm -hmm. Something's gotta be done and it's gotta be done quick because us residents down there are really getting close. I, 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 I live down the street on Main Street, so I do it on high on higher ground than you are. 
But the I whole think, town is on the sea level. Yes, no. the, and that's why I'm saying, and I'm going to move on to allow the crew to move in. But I, what um, Mr. Cal is saying is true. But if we don't all work together, oh, that's okay. um, if we don't all start working together and really make a movement, the movement can be done. And Mr. Cal is talking about something now, and he's right. And he and many of the people that lived in that area and down Point Shirley and lived down the beach area are all experiencing this. And they want to have answers. And they don't want to wait, as I'm saying, till 2050 and whatever. Not for nothing, I'll be dead. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Me too. And, um, but anyway, but hopefully we'll get some answers. I know the chief is here, and I'm going to throw all of it on him. But he's going. He's seen all my damage. <laughs> I would just but like if, if I can suggest, and not, not to butt in, because I know you all have a thousand questions. Yeah and all want to speak, and we want you all to do that, but let's move a little yeah. bit on to the program. Right. Let's have people say what they're going to say, and then we're going to open it up. And and yes, I was just going to say, the chief is here, and I'm sure he is going to be able to answer many questions. Okay? He may not have all the answers, but he can answer a lot of questions. Okay? All right, thank you. And now I'm going to introduce crew. Oh, I'm sorry, I do. I'm sorry. I have a Mother's Out Front thing that I'm going to zip through because um, it, it's all about uh, plastic. So I'm going to move quickly, Aaron, so that, um, so we're saying, save a cr critter, please don't litter. Mr. Cal is going, this is baloney. But anyway, we're talking yeah, about, my, my, my my Esposito. 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 oh, Esposito, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry, and uh, we're talking about a sea of plastics. <laughs> yeah. And there are some that go on for miles and miles, so. Uh, this is some of the animals that are being harmed by the plastics. And what we're doing today, and one of our goals as mothers out front, is to ask people, and this is what this is about, reusable bags, and these are all to the right, single-use plastic bags. And if we could use, start using this, this is a reusable bag, um, and we're asking people to start using them. We, as a group, will be distributing these in about a month or so, once the weather gets a little warm, and we are going to give them free. And it's to encourage people to start using uh, reusable bags. I have to say that our, our health committee, um, am I talking, health committee, yes. <laughs> Pardon? Board, Board of, of Health. Health, yes. And they are being very good at being supportive of us to pass a, a law that our whole community will start using reusable bags. It will take time. And it will take like about a year because we have to give our retailers time to adjust and accumulate and to get money together. But hopefully within a year that will happen. And these are the bags. And this is a petition in case people didn't, many people in Winthrop signed already, but if you, before you leave, if you want to sign a petition, you can. Okay. Thank you again, everybody, for listening. And now back to the show. Tonight, when you leave from the Medical Reserve Corps, so yes. you will be getting something tonight. Yes. Okay, um, so, hello, everyone. My name is Craig Altimos, and I'm with Communities Responding to Extreme Weather for Crew. And so, and my colleague Aaron and I. Hello. Hello. Introduce yourself. I'm Aaron. We're going to be talking a little bit about the climate impacts here in Winthrop. Um, you guys, just a little bit more about Crew. We're a young organization that aims to build equitable, inclusive neighborhood climate resilience in New England through hands-on education, service, and planning. So we're really, the short version of that is we're really about social resilience, of, of how do we bounce back to storms and to, to climate change. Um, and as Steve articulated, that, that, you know, there, there kind of are two ways to look at resilience. There's the infrastructure, there's the roads, the bridges, the natural berms you can put up to, to stop sea levels. But then there's also social resilience. It was a burden on Steve's daughter that he could stay with her, but he had someone to stay with. Right? So, so Steve was more resilient because he had family to rely upon. 
And one of the key things about getting through these storms, getting through climate change, is, is having a community to rely upon, uh, of friends, neighbors, family, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but that's really what we're all about, is through education, through service and planning, trying to build up our ability to bounce back from the stressors that climate change is going to impose upon us. Um, so we've heard a lot about climate change, just a little bit more. Um, again, the main cause is pollution from coal, oil, and gas, as, as Mary Alice and uh, Suzanne have, have noted. Um, but the, 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 the key thing I want to stress is actually that, that greenhouse gases are actually a good thing for us. Um, so the, because we have gases in the atmosphere that trap in heat, the Earth is about 60 degrees warmer than the moon, which are the same distance from the sun. So like, it's really good that we're trapping in heat. Like, it's a really important thing to have gases in our atmosphere that are keeping heat within the planet. But the problem is that as we burn, as we take coal, oil, and gas out of the ground and burn them, we take that energy and that heat and we put it into the air. And so it's basically the equivalent of adding more blankets on top of the planet. And as folks know, when you add on too many blankets <laughs> in bed, you get pretty hot, right? And what do you want to do? Kick them off, right? Or, or stick out a leg or something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to stick out a leg from a planet. <laughs> and it's hard to kick off, as Mary Alice said, the carbon dioxide says up there for over 100 years. Um, that's 100 years of the full effect. It's actually, you want to completely eliminate it for 1,000 years. Um, you, after 100 years, you start to see a decrease in the strength of carbon dioxide. Um, and one of the challenges is that as we have this extra blanket of warmth around the planet and it gets warmer, we start melting ice. And if you think about ice or snow, you know, who's, who's been skiing around here? Anyone? You, you notice how, how you want to have shades on, right, because of that glare? When you have white, a white surface, it reflects about 80% of the heat back into space. But when you have a dark surface, like the ocean, which is pretty dark blue, or green or, or brown, it absorbs about 80% of the heat. So as we start losing ice, because it melts, and we reveal underneath either ocean, like the Arctic as it's melting, or in the mountains, or in Maine, as, as we have less snow and ice covering the ground, and we reveal ground, we are then absorbing 80% of the heat, instead of reflecting back out 80% of the heat. So the more we have climate change, the more there will be climate change. It's called a positive feedback loop. So the warmer it gets, the warmer it will get. And we are currently projected to see average temperatures in the world reach anywhere from 4 to 10 degrees higher over the course of this century. And I know not everyone's going to be here over the course of the century, but there will be people here. And we do have a responsibility for those folks. And as we've noted, we're starting to feel the impacts now. Um, but as we think about temperature rise, I just want to name again, 4 to 10 degrees doesn't sound like a lot. But it turns out the Earth is pretty finely tuned like the human body, where that 98.6 degrees is a really important balance. And if you go up by a degree or two, you start getting sick. If you go up by 5 to 10 degrees within your body, that can be fatal for you. And the, pan the planet is pretty similar, where we're in this, this narrow band where the temperature has stayed very constant for the entirety of human existence. We, we've never varied more than 2 degrees in either direction on average. And we are now almost approaching it permanently being two degrees higher forever. So we're approaching the, the upper bounds of what we've ever seen, and we're starting to cross into the great unknown, the, of things we have not yet seen before. <clears throat> and, and again, just to, to elevate Steve's example, which is a powerful one, this is something where he saw it once, and then there were 30 years before seeing it. So there, there are these storms that, are, that we're supposed to get every 10 years, every 20 years, every 50 years, every 100 years. And the problem with climate change is the Pentagon calls climate change a threat multiplier. So it takes existing stuff and it makes it a lot worse, right? So this is going to, instead of seeing it once every 10 years, we saw it, or once every 30 years, we saw it twice in the same year, the same impact. And we're going to see more and more of that as things continue. Uh, so I just want to give a slight word about our logo because as Mary House identified and as Suzanne identified in the video, there are many impacts of climate change. Crew really focuses on two, heat and water coming onto our, our home. That, that's our logo and our model. That we really zero in on those two impacts for right now. 
We may add on more as we get along in terms of diseases spreading and ticks and mosquitoes and all that good stuff, or bad stuff. Uh, but for now, we're really focusing on heat and water. So I'm going to talk about the heat, and then my colleague Aaron will speak to you all about the water. Um, so, so between 1971 and 2000, Massachusetts would see about 10 days a year with temperatures above 90 degrees, and about one day a year with temperatures above 100. Already now, the average has increased to about 14 days a year. We're now seeing a temperature uh, above 100. Um, anyone know how many, how many days? Sorry, 14 days above 90. Um, and, and that's when, when we really start seeing the negative impacts of, of heat. Uh, does anyone know how, uh, what, how many days above 90 degrees we had this past year in 2018? 2023 is what we have, but we'll let you get in many. <laughs> if you seem to give this presentation next time. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, so, so 23 days in 2018, again the average is now 14, and as we project forward into the, the 2030s and the 2040s, we're expecting to see 31 days with temperatures above 90 degrees, and, and two of those days on average with temperatures above 100 degrees. Um, and and that, that's, again, as we move into the space, that's when heat starts becoming a, a nuisance and starts becoming a real danger. Um, so, so some of, of the uh, symptoms of heat exhaustion are heavy sweating, weakness, dizziness, headache, vomiting, <coughs> diarrhea, muscle cramps, breathlessness, palpitations, tingling and numbing of hands and feet, and if serious enough, ultimately, heat stroke and death. Um, approximately 680 people die every year from heat in the, in the United States right now. Um, and that number is projected to get a lot higher uh, as, again, we start having more and more days, particularly days in a row when the temperature is above 90 degrees because it's harder, to, it, if there's one day where it's 95 and then that night it goes back down to 68 at night and then it's back in the 70s, it's okay, but it's when there's day after day after day after day of extreme heat, your body can't cool itself down, that's when it gets really dangerous. And that's where we're going to start seeing a lot more of those long strings of, of days with extreme heat. Um, and there, there's one story I want to lift up. Um, there, there's a heat wave. Oh, sorry, so, well, so then as we get later into the century, again, we're talking of about between, depending, and this is the part where if we start reducing pollution, we will impact how bad it will get. Mm -hmm. So these, lo these lower numbers will we'll have about 40, 41 days above 90 degrees and six days above 100 degrees in the later part of, of the century if we take aggressive action to reduce pollution. If we don't, we're looking at more at 52 days instead of 41 above 90 and 16 instead of six above 100. Um, so really intense temperatures where, where you know, Right now in this climate, you can make it without an air conditioner. But in the future, basically, that's going to be much, much harder to do, particularly if you're a, young, a very young infant or an elderly person or someone who is sick, uh, and you've got a lower immune system, less strength to, to, to bounce back to these things. Uh, but again, I want to return to the notion of, of social resilience here, because there's a really bad heat wave that hit Chicago. Again, one of these once-in-a-century things that hit Chicago in 1995 and then the heat wave alone killed 692 people in Chicago. Um, and that they, they thought, the, the initial assumption had been that the, the fatalities around that heat wave would be solely connected to poverty and to age and to those types of factors. Um, but they did a neighborhood by neighborhood assessment and they actually found that the neighborhoods that had stronger connections weathered the heat wave much better. That the people who had neighbors who would check in on them and say, how are you doing? You know, are you doing okay with the seat? And if they weren't, either getting them into a, a cool bathtub to cool down, or making sure they're drinking water, or calling an ambulance, that those, the neighbors that had greater connections did a lot better. And in that instance, it was actually a lot of the more recent immigrant communities, where the more recent immigrants they were not very wealthy, but they had that shared experience of being strangers in a strange land and that kind of united their community together. And even the people who were not immigrants in those communities benefited from that greater network of social connectivity. Um, and so that's why a big part of, again, the Cruise model is encouraging people to, to get to know their neighbors better, to have plans to check in on each other for things like heat waves, for things like flooding, so that we're there for each other. 
and we, there's a lot of infrastructure changes we need to do, but we also really need to make sure that our communities are as strong as possible, and, and the, the, the human part of our community is as strong as possible so that we can make it through the many changes that are coming. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Aaron to, to speak more about the water side of, of that puzzle. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Craig. Um, yeah, so as Craig mentioned, the, the other piece of, of the puzzle here uh, is uh, extreme rain and snow, um, and probably the one that, you know, if you live here in Winthrop, you um, have, have felt the most, uh, for sure. And actually, as a region uh, throughout the Northeast, um, we've actually seen the greatest increase in rain falling during the very biggest storms. So really, right, the, the, the very biggest storms are getting even bigger. Um, and in particular, here in New England, that's where, that's when that's happening. Um, and as, as Suzanne said, as Mary Alice said, um, this is really just because warmer air right, holds more moisture, holds more energy. And so when it does rain or it does snow, uh, those events are going to be stronger than they were before. Um, and in the last 25 years, we've seen the amount uh, of rain that drops in those very strongest storms go up by 71%. So imagine almost double the rain falling um, in those really big storms. And that's what we're seeing today. Um, and that's going to go up uh, even more in the future. And I should mention all of these images and, and, and materials that we've been using are from uh, state, local, federal government, from very rigorous analyses that have been done here. Um, and so we're, we're fairly confident that this is uh, going to be the case moving forward. Um, and here in Winthrop, uh, so this is taken from this, the City of Winthrop's uh, Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment here. Um, you can see that today, uh, there are some areas uh, that, are, that are fairly prone to, fl to flooding, but when we talk about fairly prone to flooding, we talk about flooding that happens you know, once every 20 years, once every five years. Maybe in some areas of Winthrop, you, you can sort of see the darkest uh, blue areas there. Maybe it's, maybe it's almost every year at this point. Uh, but moving forward in time, right, that flooding gets more and more frequent. And so those dark blue areas, those are flooding once a year at least. And so you can see, right, it's not so much that you're getting totally new areas that have never flooded before, right? The people on the top of the hill um, are, may still be dry during those storms. Um, but the people at the bottom of the hill, right, the people uh, in those lower lying areas um, are going to be flooding uh, more and more often. Um, and the other big piece of this puzzle here is that the depth of the flooding, right, how much, right, you, you could get an inch of flooding, you could get a foot of flooding, it's going to be a very different experience for you. Um, that depth of flooding in those same areas is going to go way up. <coughs> so you can see uh, uh, areas like Belle Isle Marsh, Lewis Lake, the golf course area, Ingleside Park, Winthrop Beach, Point Shirley. Uh, areas that already feel flooding um, are going to feel it more often. And when it does happen, it's the, the floods are going uh, to be higher. Right? And so even if you're at the top of that hill, right, there's no way you're coming down that hill uh, if there's five feet of flooding at the, at the bottom of that hill. Right? You're going to be stuck right there. Um, and, and so this, this is concerning right, for everyone, um, not just for, for, for the people who, who live in areas that, uh, that have already experienced flooding. Got a couple of videos here. Uh, just to illustrate, right, um, turn down the, the volume here, but I think this is the, the, that big storm that happened uh, 2017 last year. Uh, and, and you can just really see um, sort of the, the, the major impacts of the flooding here. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm sure everyone here has had personal experiences, um, and I'm sure uh, after Gene speaks and after the Chief speaks, uh, we, we'd certainly love to, love to hear them here. Um, but you can just see how, how dramatic this flooding is. Um, and, and again, as Craig said, it's, it's so important, uh, that social resiliency component, um, making sure right, to check on your neighbors, uh, making sure uh, uh, that people are doing okay, that they have the stuff they need. Um, especially um, because these, these storms are coming more often, especially in the winter months, um, when it is uh, most dangerous, right, to be cold and wet um, and, and you don't have power in your house. That is a uh, Pico Park, by the way, on the, on the harbor side. Um, and to the left of that would be Corinna Beach, or what they call Fishman's Bend. Yeah, let me. Got another one over here, and I think this one is Revere Street near the Winthrop Parkway. Yeah, and you can just see, right? It's, it's right, how, how are you going to that? It's going forward in time, right? In the next 10 years, the next 20 years, not even, right? Not even talking about the way it's 2070, right? The 2030, right? Something is something that's fairly close, uh, fairly close by. Um, you, can, you can see how difficult this gets if you have a few more inches of flooding and other foot of flooding. Can everyone let him talk, please? There's a lot of chatter, and I want to listen to him, okay? 
Thank you. Yeah, um, I'll just I'll, I'll pass it back to Craig to, to close out here. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll turn to the medical reserve corps in a moment. But just to say, so you know, we do have a sign-up sheet uh, in the back that where you can check off one of those upfront crew or MRC, or you can check off all three if you'd like to get more involved. With all of us. But you know, we, we are looking for folks who might want to help Winthrop build up social resilience in, in the face of these things and think about how, how this community can work together to support the efforts of the chief and others in the community and the MR the medical reserve corps um, who are ready to, to help prepare folks, ready to help respond to these disasters and to make sure that we're all taking the appropriate steps to work together. What was the third group you just mentioned? The Medical Reserve Corps, which, we'll, which we imminently are going to get to hear from Thank you. Uh, with, with Gene here. Um, but yeah, I just want to, uh, and yeah, so here's, yeah, here's the, um, so again, our website, if folks want to get involved as well, is climatecrew.org, um, and you can email Aaron at Aaron at climatecrew.org. Um, but again, just want to emphasize, you know, that there are a lot of changes coming. I think as a whole society, we are, we are not prepared for them. Um, and it's going to take all of us really having that community mindset of, of how do we best support each other, support our neighbors, support our friends and family, um, is really going to be what gets us through. So, are you, um, where are you based on? Uh, our office is, is in Cambridge. Um, so so we're, we're, we're focused on Massachusetts right now. Um, and we work in multiple communities around, around the state. Right? We, we don't have people on the ground the way that that Gene and, and the MRC crew do, which... So anyway, I think we'll, we'll turn... The, do you have the slides, too, Gene, are we? No. Okay, so if we're done with the slides, then we'll yes. turn that Gene into that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. You know, when, when we got together, the, the three organizations, and, and started to plan this kind of a thing, each, each of us had, our, you know, our own little spiel, our own thing. All of them were really coordinated. But when you actually hear some of the presentations tonight, one of the things that I'm going to start off that's a little different to what I had planned is, and no one be offended, I look out into the audience and I see a generation. Okay? I'm in that generation, so I'm not insulting you because I'm part of that. And so what I say is, we recognize it. We can do something now, but it's all our other family that are really the ones that are going to have to pick up the pieces and really help this planet stay alive. So our generation's responsibility to do little things that we can do now to help, but to also encourage our family members, our grandchildren, their children, etc., is really to make them aware of what's going on and what can they do to help. And I think that's one of the major things we have to come away with today of really getting the next generation to really become involved in this. So, what is the Medical Reserve Corps? Some of you know us, some of you don't. We're all volunteers. We've been in Winter for over 10 years. Some people didn't even know we were here. If I said we were the Red Cross, would you know who we were? Would you understand more of what we do? We're not the Red Cross. <laughs> but we've been around for many storms. Yeah. We're at the flu clinics. We're at the rabies clinics. We give out water when the pipes break. We, we take care of people when they're evacuated from Governor's Park because of fires. So we've been around. We open shelters sometimes when the chief gives me the word to open a shelter because there's power outages and we need to take care of our citizens. We do medical things and not, lots of non-medical things. We're always looking for citizen volunteers. You don't have to be a medical person to become part of us. What is our major role tonight? We were supposed to talk on preparedness. What do we do when Steve has to leave his home? Okay, what should he take with him? What does he have in his closet in a bag that he can grab for every member of his family so when they have to run out the door, at least they have something that keeps them going for a couple of days until they either can get to family or they can get to a shelter and they can be taken care of. So we have to learn how to prepare in the event we have to evacuate. But we also have to learn how to prepare if we're going to hunker down in our house and the power goes up. What do we do? We're all used to TV and tablets and microwave ovens, and everything's easy because it's right there. But when the power goes out, reality hits. What do we do? So one of the first things I'm going to say is, how many of you have a can opener? 
laughing. I'm glad to see that. I always try to make people laugh with this. Because the electric can open, it doesn't work. And you can't okay. cook things. So what kind of products do you have in the house that you literally could open a can and still feel comfortable eating? Do you have tuna fish? Do you have peanut butter and marshmallow? Do you have crackers? Do you have a phone? Oh, I love the yes. See? See? You've heard us over the years when we talk about this. So, how many of you have toilet paper? Toilet paper. <laughs> oh, yeah. how, how many of you have a bathtub that you fill with water so you can flush the toilet in case you can't? Okay? You need water to flush the toilet. All right? You also need to have some supplies of drinking water in your house because maybe the water isn't going to work or maybe the water has become polluted. You don't know. So, having cases of water in your house is not a bad thing to do. If you have. One of my favorite little toys. It's a little toy. This is an LED light. And you cannot believe how much light it gives off in a space in your home. You can get these Walmarts, LL Beans, wherever you want to go. They're not that expensive. I suggest that you have more than one. So, you know, if you have little kids, they get a little afraid. If you're going to sleep in a separate room, one for them, one for the bathroom, one for the kitchen, you know, to have one so that you have some lighting in the house. If you have some kind of an emergency radio, all right, one that operates on batteries, this one happens to be one of those ones you can crank, okay? It also has a little spot in it where you can charge your cell phone, because if the power goes out, can you, can you charge your cell phone if you have no electric? So how do you charge your cell phone? Where do you get that? <laughs> 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 L.L. Bean does it, and they're, they're great on this, especially like outdoor and emergency equipment. But there's many things if you go online, where everybody's an online shopper today, you can find these things. I will tell you they're not inexpensive for this particular kind of a radio, but they are worth it. Or a battery radio, you know, a radio you can have batteries in that operate is, is fine as well. But you also need something to have your, your cell phone charged. So, and these do have them built in. What about your little pet? Do you have pet food in the house for the dog, for the cat, for the python, for the parrot? <laughs> <laughs> you have to make sure that you have that kind of a thing. How many of you in your wallet have a communication card so that if anything ever happened, they look in your wallet and Steve has his wife's number, children's number, his doctor's number, his minister's number. You have a communication, so if they need to know how to get in touch with somebody, you have this in your wallet. How many of you have ICE in your phone? I-C-E. Anybody know what that stands for? It's an emergency. <laughs> somebody has heard us over the years. <laughs> That's right. In your phone, you type in I-C-E. And that's a number that if the um, ambulance service, fire service, whatever service, in an emergency, they see ICE, that's an emergency contact number, that's what you want to have in your phone. Okay? So make sure when you go home tonight, you put ICE in your phones. All right? Now, <clears throat> code red. How many of you are on code red in town? Code red is the phone call where you hear that charming voice of Chief Lanigan <laughs> who will tell you what the emergency is, okay? Maybe it's a power outage someplace. Maybe the bridge is out. Maybe whatever. The bridge is falling. But, <laughs> but he, that is what Code Red registers you for. You can fill out a form, which you will find in your bags tonight, or you can go right on the town website, and you can register right on the town website for that. Okay, and that's an important thing. You do want to be on cold red. How many of you have weather alerts on your cell phones? So you're out in Cambridge somewhere and there's a hurricane coming and Winthrop is going to get hit. The weather report will give you an emergency um, response if you put in the weather alert into your phones. Some of the news stations do the same thing. They give you updated weather reports, things like that. So let's talk about that go kit that Steve had in his closet when he had him evacuate with all his family. And in the closet, there's five members, I don't know Steve, there are five members of his family. Okay? 
<laughs> okay, we're going to talk about that too. All right, so in Steve's bag, or wife's bag, or children's bag, they have a couple of days clothes. They have medications, just my little medical thing, okay, medications. They have um, some, they may have copies of some emergent, of some important documents, like copies of the deed to your house, maybe a bank statement, maybe a medical record. And you can buy waterproof holders in places like Staples or Office Max or something like that, where you should keep, if not the originals, keep the copies of those kind of documents accessible in case you have to evacuate. All right, let's talk about that pet, okay? I tell the story all the time. After Katrina, I went down to New Orleans, and I met with many emergency personnel. And I said to them, why did so many people die during Katrina? One of the reasons was, is because when people went to evacuate, they wouldn't let their pets go with them. And so people opted to stay, and unfortunately, many people and their pets died. Oh. Winthrop's Medical Reserve Corps from the very beginning. I'm so proud when I say this. Yes. <laughs> okay, if you go, they go. That's if right. you come to the shelter, they come with you. We have setups, we have trained people who will help take care of your animal if you have to come to a shelter and you bring them with you. They will never, ever be left behind again. So That's right. <laughs> Talking about heat, we do have setups for the summer. For example, if we had a major power outage, and again, it's all from the chief, he tells me what to do. Mm -hmm. If the power goes out, he said, we need to open a, a, a cooling station because it's going to be 110 <coughs> degrees. We have setups so that we can open, for example, it might be the senior center. It might be one of the schools if they're not in session because we need to go to a place that has generators and has cooling facilities, okay? It may be the same thing on the opposite. If the power goes out in the winter and you lose your heat, mm -hmm. for example, places like the housing authority, if they lose electric and they have no power and it's gonna be a cold spell for a week, we can't take a chance of people, you know, ultimately freezing to death. So again, a code red call would say things like that tell you if those kind of operations are available. You never go to a shelter unless you get the word that a shelter is open. You just don't assume that. I want to explain to you, if you have to come to a shelter, you're not going to get a roast beef dinner. <laughs> you're going to be lucky to get a slice of pizza and a munchkin. Yeah. <laughs> so I know, because one year we, when we opened the shelter, we had a couple of people come in and really did expect a roast beef dinner. <laughs> and it wasn't going to happen. One thing I want to say about medications. I know medications are expensive. However, if you can keep a month's supply in that go kit, and then every month rotate them, so you take this one now, you use the map, and now you put another one. Because you don't want the, the medications to expire. Mm -hmm. So you have to rotate things. If you have a, a crate with food supplies or water supplies, again, look at the dates, mark everything, and you might have to rotate them every month or two, just to make sure that you're keeping everything, you know, in a viable state and that it's good for you, okay? Now tonight, when you get your little bags that aren't plastic, that you can use when you go shopping, you're going to find in it information. You're going to find some code red forms. You're going to find a booklet on how to prepare for emergencies and what to get. A couple of other little goodies. One is a little little, um, I call it a glove compartment first aid kit. Mm -hmm. You're going to get an emergency keychain that is a light and a whistle. It's the kind of whistle that's really kind of loud and it's an emergency whistle. Okay, if God forbid something, you were in your apartment and you fell down, it's not the I can't get up one, but, you know, it's a noise. It's going to, someone's going to keep, you're going to keep hearing. All right, and one of the things I want to bring to your attention too, I, I think Craig and, and Mary Alice and Aaron said the same thing, and it's called human resiliency. We are our best advocates. We are our neighbors' best friends. We are your family's best friends. In a storm, who do you call? How are you doing?
doing, son? Are you okay? I know there's like 10 feet of snow up there. How are you doing? Or if you live in an apartment house, you might knock on your neighbor's door. Mrs. Smith, how are you doing? You okay? Do you need anything? Because Mrs. Smith happens to be 85 years old, walks with a cane, may need a little assistance. So what we have to learn to do even more, and, I, and trust me, I've lived in Winthrop for 50 years, I know I'm a rookie, but we, Winthrop is really a great neighborhood community. We really do look out for one another. And we have to continue to do so. Whether you live in a housing area, whether you live in a private home, whether you live in a condo, doesn't matter. We're all neighbors and we all gotta look out for one another. Okay, forgive me if I breathe a lot, I can't, I've just been over bronchitis for three weeks, so it's been kind of tough to breathe, but anyway. Um, we're going to ask for questions and answers um, from the audience afterwards, but I know you've been waiting for the star attraction. <laughs> and so we're going to ask Chief Flannery to come in and talk to you about a variety of things, whatever you want. Okay, Chief. Yeah, the chief. Well, those who don't know me, my name is Paul Flanagan. I'm the chief of the Winter Fire Department. I've been here for 41 years. 11 is chief. Um, I'm the son of a fire chief, so I've been a storm chaser, you know, since I should have been home nights doing my homework when I was out with my father chasing storms. So I'm here. But basically what I'd like to say, number one, is that the town has not been asleep on this. The big problem of Winthrop is a large section of us is below sea level. Ingleside Park, Maryland Ave, Townsend. The town just did a, a, a sore project down on Taft's Ave, Maryland, Townsend. Um, last Thursday, because we didn't have a storm, the ocean was just beautiful, but we had a 12 foot 4 tide, which is a huge astronomical tide. The tides at Deer Island, like Boston Harbor, they can range from as low as 8.5 feet to 12.4, which is one of the biggest tides we've had in several years. But so you can just see on the normal cycle of the the, the, the moon and, and the tides, we, we can change 5 feet. So with that being said, 13.7 is what is kind of a benchmark for us. They're talking that we have a 10 foot tide, the nor'easters coming up the coast, they're talking a two foot storm surge, and they're talking wave action. We're looking at that number 13.7 because we have areas of the town that definitely go under at 13.7. Um, you know, the council president, Ron Vecchio, we were down, you know, taking on lumps and bumps a year or so ago down on Morton Street with the residents. That this has never happened before until they built the, the nature walk and the whole thing. But the key word to that whole storm was, it was historic. And that was the thing that was hot. A couple of people told us, we don't want to hear the facts. Well, the facts are why we flooded. Uh, you know, Winthrop was built hundreds of years ago. If you go to the Seaport District, that's in its infancy. And that had three feet of water running down the street into the subway. So we can't be as resilient as the seaport is, and the seaport, which is brand new, is not resilient. They're already in trouble. But again, going back that the town, we got a $500,000 FEMA mitigation grant for the streets down in Maryland towns, and it was all to enlarge the sewer pipes to put what we call duck bills on the outfall you know, storm water that, or flood waters that go back into the harbor at low tide. And what a duck bill does, it just closes. It automatically closes just due to the elasticity of the device that they put at the end of the pipe that you see all over town. So that doesn't allow seawater to come in, because what was happening with those streets, if we had a 12 foot 4 tide like we did last Thursday, water seeks its own level. Mm -hmm. So if it's 12 foot 4 in the harbor, and Maryland Ave is two feet below sea level, you have two feet of water on Maryland Avenue. But with a duck bill, it will not allow the water to go the other way. The day the gentleman said that he was overtaken down on uh, Morton Street, at the same time he was flooding, Pico was flooding, 
That's right. And, and the thing is, you people are all here because you care about our town, you care about the environment. Some of our biggest obstructionists in protecting the town are environmentalists. You know, everybody says, why can't we just put in what he's saying, what uh, Mr. Esposito was saying, that there was a berm that was on Morton Street. Well, that berm was probably formed over 20 years of a northwest wind just buffering that coast, just keep coughing stuff up. As they were working there, they kind of cleaned up, you know, even like the Friends of Belle Isle are always cleaning that coastline. But they were looking to have a berm put back. There's no way. That's an ECAC protected area. You can't put anything there. Anything that winds up naturally put there can stay there. But we couldn't replace it. And that was one of your arguments. And I went out on a limb, and one lady said, I've lived here 59 years. I've never been flooded, which was a true statement because it was historic. We never had so much water. But again, what has to happen in winter, we need a storm. We need an astronomical high tide. We need the storm to come at the time of high tide, and we need the right wind direction. So even though the water is rising and it will have its effect, we still need a lot of things lining up. With that being said, the more storms you have, the better the odds are in the winter things are going to line up. So I assured everybody on Morton Street, you may never see this again in your lifetime, and we were back there in six months saying, who would have thought we're here again? But it was, but again, it was another historic storm. And I lost a $500,000 fire engine in that flood, but what had happened was, that storm, we had an astronomical high tide. The storm came right up the coast. Because if a storm surge comes in at low tide, it has no effect on our community. Everything lined up perfect. So the storm come up the coast at high tide, the four foot storm surge came in, and we had from no calls to over 100 houses flooded almost immediately. When we have a nor'easter coming up the coast, and they're playing something up for Monday now, but we just went through our high tide cycle, we already have people calling up, I'd like to get on the pump list. Well, on the pump list, the song's not here yet, but I know if it is. <laughs> so I'll have 10 people on the pump list, whether we get the song or not. <laughs> so that's one of the, the things we deal with. Going back to the heat, another thing that we run in with our senior community, we're in the fourth day of a heat wave, you go to their house and it's absolutely stifling, and they'll say to you, you'll ask them, why didn't you open your windows? I didn't want to let the heat in. Yeah. <laughs> well, the house is 98 degrees, let some of it out. So that's a problem in Insola. We ran a class three weeks ago for our firefighters for safety with solar panels. We have over 200 houses in winter now with solar panels. They're never, there's no way to completely shut them off and have them de-energized. Um, this summer, I think, they're starting the solar field on the top of the new high school, middle school. That solar panel is capable of generating 265,000 watts. So it is a hazard to anybody who's up on the roof. But going back, I think, and you can correct me, Mr. President, there's going to be a mitigation project down uh, Ingleside Park that's grant uh, funded to store yeah. more stormwater runoff. As everybody knows, it's a bowl down there. Everybody, everything goes that way. And if we got 10 inches of rain in 10 minutes at low tide, mm -hmm. it's going to run out to the harbor. If it's high tide, it's not going mm -hmm. anywhere until the hydro pressure on the ocean side allows the water, you know, it's less than what's in the park to let it run out. <coughs> that day that you were talking with the big rain storm, the water was up on the rink door, yeah. two and a half feet. That was in October, yeah. And that, you know, we got four inches of rain in two hours. It was high tide, you can't leave the town. But the town is addressing that project. Uh, down at Coughlin Park, down Point Shirley, since that park was first done over and it was just redone, we've easily lost 30 feet of that park. And I think we just got a grant, you can correct me, to do the revetment in that, that area. But any time that we've gone to uh, any agency, FEMA or anywhere else, looking for seawall help or anything like that, they don't believe in seawalls anymore. They believe in the ocean finding its own boundaries, which that's a little late for us here in winter. <laughs> so, uh, so we're trying to work around it. As you see, there's development going to happen down the center. 
There's going to be new uh, infrastructure down there. Every new, whether it's a two-family house or it's a 30-unit condominium, the building codes have changed. You're in charge of your own stormwater runoff. You no longer can build a building and just let your downspouts run out into the street and just add to our problems. You have to have the capabilities of storing that water. So really, on a town level, there's not much I can do about global warming, if you will. The town, the council are constantly reaching out for grants and things. We know we have problems. Uh, the riprap, home seawalls, our overall infrastructure that's around the town is, you know, back in the World War I work periods where they were building cement walls. A lot of you know there's public access to the water. It's difficult because the stairs are busted. And it's going to take millions and millions of dollars to correct it. But they're very much aware of it. So, you know, little things that we like to see down in Morton Street, if you get two feet of water, people have stairwells down to their basement, and that works as the drain to fill their basement. I mean, we're not going to save you on those full foot storm surges, but there's a lot of things as residents you can tighten up on. Uh, but again, you know, the town's people are working on it. Um, it's been a problem. But it's going to, as you hear, it's going to be continue to be a problem. Very impressed with the crowd that was here. I was with the crew one of the first meetings and kind of was like a little punch and thing. What do you guys want? And you know, poor Jean thought they were going to take over her MIC. <laughs> but it did work. The combination of everybody getting together uh, brought the people out. And again, as far as uh, the flooding and everything in winter, you know, we're trying to correct our end of it, but it's not going to happen overnight. And even when they were speaking about we're going to start the power plans for their emissions. That's all coming back to the taxpayer again because the utility companies are able to do the whole thing. So it's going to be a long haul, but I appreciate everybody coming out. And again, Code Red, if you do sign up for Code Red, it doesn't matter what your exchange on your phone line or the thing that's important is your address. Because a lot of times we have things that only impact a certain neighborhood and we can draw a line around it, and we're going to call the property within that zone. <coughs> the key to the whole thing, it doesn't matter what your phone exchange is, it plays with your address. So if anybody has any questions, that's all. I know um, the city of Boston got hit by a policy district in East Boston, Charlestown. Is anyone saying that we're working with officials from the city of Boston? Uh, they're doing their homework on what to do to somehow prevent more flooding. I, I don't know exactly what they have planned, but every time I um, watch the news, when there is an approaching storm, okay. there is some talk about spending millions of dollars. They wanted to eat off Boston Harbor, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> which they did wasn't practical. And I guarantee you when they started, just like when we were in re nourishing the beach, and now they, they, they put a, they just put a copper dam up down at the public landing to redo the boat ramp, and it had to be done now. And we're worried about impacting the beginning of the boat season, but we had to take the flounder, the lobsters, you had to take everything into consideration before you could do that, and that's why that's now. But Boston, the mayor appropriated ten million dollars just to move up IT in his own building to the city. And we're going to ask for more questions and things that you want to talk about. Um, I think one of the suggestions one time was, for example, like a home like yours that's sort of near the water, people are starting to move all their electrical and their heating and their things up so they're not in the cellar on the floor anymore. That was one thing that they did talk about. Um, as the chief explained to me one time, if we start to build walls around our house, maybe the water won't come here, but you're going to divert it to your neighbors. Yeah, right. So cement walls aren't the answer either. So we have to be aware of things like that. Team, we had a couple of questions. Yes. For the chief. The chief, yes. Um, yes. I'm, um, I know we want to talk about things like that. Could you stand up so that people keep hearing? Can you stand so that I can hear? Yes, I know we haven't mentioned earthquakes, and I know probably nobody's thinking of earthquakes, but they happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm, the, I'm a fortunate survivor of a major earthquake in Japan, 
And I know they happened in Japan, but it had never happened where I had lived. So I always think in terms of earthquake. Um, one thing I want to say that to, I still practice is not to have anything heavy near your bed, anything that can fly. That saved me. Um, another thing is, I always think in terms of what is our escape because Winthrop is so vulnerable with the water all around us and the one road through town. And I wonder if there's any escape rooms. Well, again, what's happening is a lot of the things that are happening, we're a member of UASI which is the nine communities that surround Boston Harbor, which, and this is after the, uh, the attack of the World Trade Center. Boston is rated one in a, a tiny area for terrorism, not earthquakes, but the regional assets that they have done is, you know, we have a FEMA team in Beverly that gets deployed all over the country. But they're training out of these nine <coughs> communities. We have our own urban area search and rescue teams for after the fact and they will come in because usually they don't stand up FEMA teams for the first 24 to 30 hours after a disaster. Well, with that being said, the same group, UASI, has done an evacuation. But one of the biggest problems is when a storm comes up the east coast, it's affecting 80 million people. Mm -hmm. This is where the population is. That's why when you look at an election night, whole country can be one color, but if the East yeah. Coast is, then that's how the election goes almost. But what happened is we do have an evacuation plan, but it doesn't matter if they hire a company that does all the evacuations for Florida or wherever. We are, and I use the term all of the time, especially when I'm trying to get money out of the council, that we are geographically challenged here in winter because we get to blend into the whole movement. If it is a storm that's coming our way, Revere is the same problem. They close the floodgates on us. But as far as an earthquake goes, you know, being a, being a possible tsunami risk, I don't see the evacuation being like they're evacuating everybody. I mean, we have to move everybody. And we've always talked that we are kind of, and as the crew says, as a community, we have to protect ourselves. We've always said we're going to have to protect in place. The tsunami, we're in trouble. And, uh, you know, I don't say that to scare anybody. I mean, we can come to the center of town, but if it's a Sunday afternoon and we have 19,000 people, <laughs> yeah. we're in trouble. I didn't mean to that. But just so you know, <laughs> if we have architects in Winthrop working on a public safety building slash firehouse police station, and any public safety building that's being built has to be earthquake resistant. So you're welcome to fly. <laughs> <laughs> the one nice thing about climate change is that it's supposed to make heat waves and, and yeah. wildfires and droughts and hurricanes and tornadoes worse, but it is not supposed to make earthquakes worse. So we're not likely to see more. Not, not that one earthquakes won't happen again. All these things happen naturally, but they're not supposed to get worse because of climate change. Although, again, it's great to be prepared for all We're on a major fault line. Yeah. Right across the country, we have one of the most major fault lines right underneath us. So. Um. I just have a point. I think part of this point is that we need to re reduce our footprint. All of us yeah. need to do that. And I just want to, it's very easy just to call Mass Save, and they have a great program. They have energy efficiency, and they can make a huge difference on it. Because if all of us make a small difference, change a few light bulbs, it really does make a difference overall. There's millions of people. Well, they'll re reverse you 75 Yeah, it's a great program. Yeah. They'll, they'll insulate, they'll seal the windows. They come and give you a free energy audit, so yeah. they'll let you know yes. what you can do to save money. They give you right. some things immediately to do that are free to do, and then they, they give you great discounts and a lot of other yeah. stuff. Sorry. But yeah, I think that's a really great point. Yeah. So, yes. Is that just for single family homes? No. 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 It, it, they don't do it for condo. Oh, they don't? Uh, yeah. Okay, well, we, so I, I'm actually a renter in yeah. Somerville, and, and we, we were able to do it for our building, but we had to get the permission of the different tenants and the landlord. Right. You have to do the whole building, the entire building. You can't do it individually, yeah. by unit. Yeah. Well, hopefully 
we have done a good job tonight. Hopefully you have learned something and taught us something.